grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon title for today is Christian Campers. Now, some of you may have gone to Christian camps, or maybe you've lived by a Christian camp. Our DCE was once a counselor at a Christian camp. However, to be clear, I'm not really talking about a, a Christian camps like Camp Lakeview. Uh, the key point today is rather, like cam camping is temporary. Now, you may spend a night or a weekend, but eventually, after your camp, you're going home. Well, in 2 Corinthians, Paul basically calls our world, our lives, our bodies, our existence here, a tent. Christians know that our time living in the world as it stands today is temporary because God has a bigger plan both for us and for our world. Now, the Greek word that's translated as tent could also be translated tabernacle, as in the tabernacle the Israelites used while traveling in the wilderness, but not, not yet made it to the promised land. Remember, they had to have something that was temporary and could be packed up and moved because they were moving a lot in the wilderness. It was a, a fancy tent that was used as a worship center and also as the the guest house for Yahweh. Those Israelites in the wilderness, they were on a journey. They were camping, we might even say. They were certainly living in tents, although their camping trip was a little longer than just Labor Day weekend. However, they had been promised a home. Yahweh had promised the Israelites that he would take them right to a land flowing with milk and honey, with more than enough rat natural resources for all the things that they would need. However, if you remember, that journey through the wilderness could have been 40 years shorter. The Israelites arrived at the doorstep of the promised land, and they decided to send in 12 spies to check out the land. And after they returned two of those spies, Joshua and Caleb counseled for them to rely on the Lord and to go into the promised land. However, the other 10 spies were scared. The other guys were big and powerful and had better weapons. And so they advised not going into the land, despite what God had told them to do. And the Israelites took the advice of the 10 and did not walk into the land because they doubted God's promises and plan. So God had to teach them to walk by faith and not by sight. They, they didn't need to make all their plans based only on what they could see or observe, such as fearing or retreating from enemies that were larger or more powerful than they were. Since they wouldn't walk in the promised land, God punished them by making them walk everywhere but in the promised land for 40 years. And it worked pretty well, actually. 40 years later, the Israelites did a lot better job under Joshua as they entered the promised land. With some notable exceptions, they were able to walk by faith because they repeatedly had experienced God's grace. When they, um, their pilgrimage in the wilderness had taught them to walk, literally to walk by faith. And they learned a couple of important lessons while wandering in that wilderness. First of all, disrespect Yahweh and their will be consequences. When they grumbled and rebelled, they were punished by poisonous vipers or by the earth opening up. Other times they learned to walk by faith because they repeatedly experienced God's provision for them. When they actually needed something, be it bread or meat or water, Yahweh always provided what they needed. So Paul's comparing our sufferings, our troubles, our persecutions, our hardship in this life when we are as Christians, as followers of Christ, to the Israelites walking in the wilderness. We don't always know where our next step will take us or where God will lead. Sometimes we're afraid of things that look too big for us or for our God, but God teaches us to take the next step, trusting in him and his promises, walking by faith. We walk around 
but in this world, at least as it is right now, it's not really where we will end up. It's not permanent. We move about in this world, but it's not really our home. In fact, sometimes Paul says we ache and groan. If we're being honest, we also sometimes act like those Israelites. We grope and moan a little bit. But uh, overall, we're being encouraged to live as if there's more than just what we can see to live for. We aim for a higher calling we have in Christ Jesus. It'd be very tempting, it is very tempting, to simply set up shop on earth here as if this is all that there is, the things that we can see, the things that we can buy, that's all there is. And that's all we need to live for or really worry about. In fact, we all, sometimes myself included, forget that our ultimate goals in life are not simply to have a good retirement or as get as much stuff or be as entertained as we possibly can be. No, we have a greater purpose. And so we don't spend all our time pursuing stuff or seeking highs. Instead, we walk by faith. We have a different set of values than the world does, and while we certainly may enjoy this world at times, we still live accordingly, in, according to the instructions of our Lord, instead of just following our own heart's desires. We put our hope not in retirement account or in our stuff, but in the eternal promises of Jesus. And that means that practically sometimes we will sacrifice our own pleasure or give up some of our stuff for the good of God's kingdom. And that means that we champion forgiveness, not revenge. We know God has given us all good things in Christ, and so because God has given us all, we pay it forward by sharing at least some with others. We live to see not just our own personal agendas advanced, but God's goals advanced, because As we grow in our faith, we realize that God's plans are better than any plans we could ever come up with. Paul puts it in this way. The love of Christ compels us, or the that's what I grew up with. The ESV translation is the love of Christ controls us. Either way, the point is there's a comparison. Many people, and we too sometimes, are driven only by our stomachs, or our egos, or by the pleasure centers in our brain. And that the default mode of humankind is to think, what's in it for me? However, you and I, because we have been freed by Christ, and we've experienced his great love and grace, we're no longer controlled by our ego, but rather by the love of Christ. I may want something, but what Christ calls me to is more important. And that's what Paul means when he says the love of Christ compels or controls us. It's the love of Christ that motivates us. Now, we are, again, all too familiar with sinful thinking. We don't want to paint too pretty of a picture as if we never struggle with sin. The selfish flesh is always saying, I want want what's best for me and forget about everybody else. It says, I don't really care who I hurt or who is left holding the bag when I shirk my responsibilities. If I can get away with it, I will. We sin, and so we continue to confess our sins and to come to God pleading for his mercy. Yet, we are a new creation in Christ, and that means that we no longer have to be enslaved to selfish thinking and to self-serving actions. When we make mistakes, we can confess them and move forward because we serve a new master, a new Lord, the Lord who has made us new by sharing his very spirit with us. After all, that that selfishness, that sin-soaked life is really only a shell of our former selves. And that reminds me of something that I'm sure you've seen a lot of, reminds me of the thousands of cicada shells that I've got just in my own backyard, literally shoveling them out from under my trees. You know, those cicadas, they grow, they grow up so fast. And they, they shed those exoskeletons along the way. Why? Because they've grown too big for those old confining exoskeletons. They need more space. 
They need a, a new body to live their full, short, very loud lives. And it's the same for those of us who are growing up in Christ. Well, maybe not the same in every way. We don't look quite that bad, right? However, we have outgrown living in that petty, sin-driven sort of life because we've got something bigger and better in front of us. Those shells, you know, when you zoom in, they're not very attractive close up, at least I don't think so. Uh, the cicadas themselves aren't so bad, but those shells, ugh. Plus, they're lifeless, that they're dead. Sin, when you look close up, it really isn't very attractive either. And it too is lifeless. And that's why we shed those old sinful ways of living. And that's what Paul, one thing Paul is trying to say by calling us Christian campers, you might say. Because we're not here permanently, and we have to be reminded of that. We're not really homeowners, we're renters. Our home is not this broken world, but the restored world that God is preparing for us. We know the new heavens and the new earth is on its way in Christ. And so we're banking on God returning to this world to remake it, to remake our corrupted bodies. Sometimes we groan because things are not right. Our own lives, they're not always right. But we strive to live knowing that one day we will appear before Christ and he will make all things new. You know, we don't see that promise yet. We're not yet living in a perfected and restored world. And we could just live for ourselves. Plenty of people do. But Jesus is teaching us to walk by faith, not just to be overcome by this world, either in a, overcome with sadness or to be overcome uh, and, and follow the ways of this world, but rather to be reaching for the promised land, knowing that we are headed somewhere because our Lord leads us. We don't have to be content with this second-rate and sin-riddled world. We are a new creation in Christ. And so we seek to be that in, in our community with one another. We encourage each other to do so more and more. We offer each other um, the gifts of God's kingdom, like forgiveness and help, physical help sometimes. On occasions, we may even give or receive uh, constructive criticism as we spur one another on to, to, be, to live driven by the love of Christ. To quote Paul, directly, for as the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. We now live for the, the greater and grander purpose of living for Christ, who will one may, day make us and all of creation new and restored and bring us to our eternal home in Christ our Lord. Amen.